Uh, welcome uh, to our Fiscal Note Asia Pacific chat. Uh, my name is Sebastian Ko. Uh, I am the Managing Director for Asia Pacific at Fiscal Note. Today, we're joined by uh, Mr. Chris Liu, who is our Senior Strategy Advisor at Fiscal Note. Um, he's the former Deputy Secretary of Labor under the Obama administration, uh, voluntary member of the Joe Biden uh, Presidential Transition Agency Review Team, and he has 20 years of regulatory, legislative, and political experience. Uh, welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've come to our company? Well, I first met our CEO, Tim Huang, in 2013 when the company was getting started. And he approached me with this idea about taking policy data and uh, grafting it with technology. And when he described the concept, it was very clear to me that nobody else was doing what he wanted to do. Uh, and that was you know, eight years ago. And it's been remarkable to see this idea um, from a very, very young person now become one of the preeminent uh, policy and data companies, not just in the United States, but around the world. Having been at Fiscal Note for uh, almost since the beginning, um, where do you think uh, we've been and where do you think we're going? Well, the company started out as a policy data company and focusing really on the United States. But what has been so exciting to see is how our reach has now expanded uh, around the world, uh, not only in terms of policy data from the United States, uh, the EU, uh, several dozen foreign countries, but we've now added uh, unrivaled uh, news analysis, not only in the United States, but around the world as well. So if you are a company looking uh, to uh, manage your policy risk in the United States, we have you covered. But if you want to focus on other countries around the world, we also have those capabilities, not only news analysis, but increasingly advisory services too. Chris, uh, with the trends of uh, digitalization, how do you think the modern government relations and public affairs professional need to up their game? Let's understand how government relations typically is done. You hire somebody that's worked in government before uh, and you ask them to provide uh, their expertise and often reach out to people uh, that they have uh, worked with before. And that's still really important. We don't wanna take away human intelligence, but understand that if you are advocating on behalf of a large multinational company and you've got to manage policy risks, not just in one jurisdiction, but around the world, you can't hire enough people. That's an inefficient way of doing things. People are great, but people miss things. And so what you need to really do is marry together human intelligence, artificial intelligence, data, technology, news, analysis, consulting, advisors. And what the fiscal note platform allows you to do is to put all of that together so that you can see more things, you can see it quicker, and you could formulate the appropriate response. Chris, what can you tell us about the policy priorities of the new Biden administration? President Biden has focused on four pillars. Uh, first and most importantly is the COVID pandemic and getting that under control. Secondly, restoring the US economy, which is still in recession at the moment. The third is dealing with the global problem of climate change. Uh, and finally, it's advancing racial equity here in the United States. But it's important to understand that the umbrella that wraps all of this together is the concept of build back better. And what President Biden has talked about is it's not sufficient to bring the United States back to where we were before the pandemic. What he really wants to do is address some of the structural systemic issues that we've been dealing with in this country for far too long. And then internationally, this is an administration uh, that has is going to be uh, engaging robustly uh, with allies. It's going to be confronting our adversaries and it's going to be addressing some of these big issues like climate change in connection with multilateral organizations. What can you tell us about the foreign policy team put together by President Biden? Well, the team is led first and foremost by President Biden, uh, who served as the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has vast experience in foreign policy uh, from his time as vice president under President Obama. The people that he's assembled on his team are remarkably experienced they're talented, they understand the issues, and as importantly, they understand the players overseas. These are people who 
who are not going to embrace uh, the concept of America first, that understands that America needs to engage around the world to solve problems. That means that they will be uh, both embracing our allies more closely than the previous administration did, but also confronting our adversaries uh, when appropriate. There is so much focus on what happens with the White House and Congress, but much less attention on what happens in the states and cities. What should policy professionals outside the US understand about the federal state dynamic when it comes to shaping policy? It, it's such an important issue. Far too many people are, are myopically focused on the White House and Congress. And it is true that Democrats control both of them, but their majorities are historically small. And it's going to be challenging for uh, either party uh, to get much done in Washington, in particular because of the partisanship that continues to grow and grow with each successive administration. So I think we can expect continued gridlock in Washington with the exception of a couple of major issues, but so much of the action will continue to happen at the state and local level. So if you're a policy professional that's trying to understand what's happening in the United States, and you're only focused on Washington, you're missing a big uh, part of what's happening around uh, the country. Again, whether it's involving environmental issues, worker issues, data privacy, uh, there are states and cities that are taking the lead on these issues and the experienced policy professionals have to be focused on those jurisdictions as well. Assuming the world can get the pandemic under control and we're definitely seeing some positive signs there, what are the prospects for sustained economic growth and what are the challenges? Well, first of all, obviously we need to get the pandemic under control. And as you said, it, it is positive, uh, but we're not out of the woods yet. Uh, there continue to be concerns about variants of the virus. Uh, there's also concern that some parts of the United States and around the world may be reopening too quickly. And we've seen what happens when the economy op reopens quickly. But assuming we can get the pandemic under control, there's a lot of economic stimulus that's being put into the system. Right in the United States, uh, the Congress and the president have agreed on a $1.9 trillion spending package that comes on top of a $4 trillion package that was passed here in the United States last year. So that will do a lot to really rev up the US economy, which will obviously help the comparable efforts that are happening overseas right now. The challenge, the long-term challenge for all economies is what are the broader structural changes that have happened to the economy as a result of the pandemic. For instance, now that we can't go to stores, people are buying more online. What does that do to brick and mortar retail? What does it mean as more companies begin to allow their workers to work virtually? What does that do to the commercial real estate market? What does that do to all the businesses and workers who depend on people physically being at offices? And so these broader changes in the economy, I don't think anyone has fully addressed how it will affect small businesses and how it will affect workers. And that's one of the important issues that's going to need to be addressed moving forward. The world economy is increasingly globalized, particularly with digitization changing the way we trade and consume. These changes gave us new and complex issues in many key areas of global trade, and there are some areas of intense competition, while others call for significant cooperative strategies. Where do you think are the key areas for international cooperation and why? I think first and foremost, the, an area of cooperation is climate change. And it's notable that one of the first actions that happened under the Biden administration was rejoining the Paris Climate Change Accord. And even on an issue like climate change, we have seen traditional adversaries like the US and China agree to take action on this issue. But when you look at the broader menu of issues, whether it's intellectual property protection, data privacy, or even issues like human rights, sustainable development, there are important issues of cooperation. And as importantly, as the issues themselves is the approach that the United States will take. Uh, gone is uh, an America first approach that was embraced by the previous administration. You now have an administration in the Biden administration that understands the importance of cooperation uh, and engagement and understands that uh, 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 an engaged United States uh, is also not only good for the country, but also good for the world as well.